Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's event, Future of Test Automation, leading experts share their vision for 2017. We have an incredible expert panel, and although they need no introduction, I'll do a brief one anyway. Our moderator is Dave Hafner, author of the Selenium Guidebook and writer of Elemental Selenium Weekly Newsletter. So, um, so Dave, if you can say hi. Hello. Uh, joining him on this expert panel are Simon Stewart, Selenium Project Lead and creator of WebDriver. Simon, say, say hi. Hi, everyone. Jim Evans, the creator and maintainer of the IE Driver and creator of the Selenium C Sharp bindings. Jim, say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. And Brian Jordan, senior software developer at Code.org. Brian is an advocate for good test practices and a Selenium power user and was one of the speakers at the Selenium conference held in London last month. So, Brian, say hi. Hello, hello. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll let Dave take it from here. Great. Thanks, Adi. Uh, so, for everyone attending and watching on this recording, I just wanted to give some background to Selenium conference because I think that there's a large uh, swath of uh, testers out there, uh, automators, who aren't aware of what the conference is and why we're here to talk about it and why we're excited about it. Um, SeleniumConf is, uh, it started as the annual conference uh, for the Selenium project, for the Selenium community, uh, to, for people to meet together in a city somewhere in the world uh, and to talk about um, all things to do with test automation, Selenium, open source, um, largely rallying around Selenium. And so it's a great place where we could have committers from the project come, show up, um, and meet people who use Selenium in their daily lives, uh, in, their, in their work. And so it started in 2011, uh, it started in San Francisco, and then we from there hopped around uh, where we would alternate between going outside the US and inside the US. So San Francisco in 2011, and then we went to London in 2012, then back to the US in Boston in 2013, and then we went to India in 2014, and then back to the US in 2015 in Portland, and then this year we actually broke script and decided to try and do more than one conference, uh, both of which were outside the U.S., you know, sticking with this kind of in the U.S., outside the U.S. Uh, pattern. And so we went back to India and back to London. So uh, not only did we break script and do two, we also went back to places we'd never, uh, who, where we had been before, where traditionally we have been going to new places every year. And so... Um, London was the flagship conference this year, and uh, we're going to continue to do an annual conference, but what the conference really is also is a place where hundreds of people, uh, practitioners, committers, uh, developers, testers, all get together, uh, share ideas, and there's typically two talk tracks. Uh, we have a committee of volunteers who uh, are either members of the Selenium Project or who are practitioners in their own right who uh, help organize the conference and help select the program. Um, it's a very involved process, and so the, we're excited to talk about um, some of our key takeaways from the conference, both from talks that went into the program, uh, as well as what conversations happened between those talks in what we like to call the hallway track. Um, so I'm excited to have uh, people from, uh, from the project, as well as who attended and spoke at the conference, um, to talk about uh, their kind of key takeaways from the event. And so I guess the first question I want to start with is kind of now that we've had some time to process and ruminate uh, after the fact from the conference, are there any favorite talks or a favorite talk uh, that stuck with you um, after the fact, uh, assuming that you didn't just uh, spend all your time in the hallway track, which is what I typically do. Um, but uh, we'll start with you, uh, Simon, and work our way to the right. Uh, so Simon, Jim, Brian. So Simon, do you have a favorite talk that really stuck with you? And you can't you can't say you can't say your own talk, by the way. So uh, well, my own was phenomenal, of course. Of um, course, of course. <laughs> um, I think the there were a couple. There was, I mean, the, the, lots of excellent talks. Um, I think Anthony Marcono's talk um, about the uh, I forget the name of it. I always call it actor, but a screen screenwriter pen was uh, excellent. One where he goes and, and takes page objects and breaks them down and, and applies some sort of good object oriented design to it and goes like, hey, look, here's the thing that, that happens. Um, and, and the reason why, go on. No, I just to say, I remember that you mentioned that even in your keynote that you thought it was really something you, you were excited about. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen a draft of it before, um, but seeing Anthony, it was great. 
Um, and the reason why I like that is because so many times in the conference we've had talks about page objects and how to use page objects and stuff like that. But this was one of the first times where it's like, here's a concrete evolution of that pattern um, and interesting things you could do. Um, the other talk that I quite enjoyed was uh, Jonathan Lips, um, just because it was thoroughly entertaining sort of listening to him talk about sort of Appium Star or a uh, star driver. Star driver, yes, using uh, an, an absurd amount of 80s sci-fi movie references. Exactly. Um, and the other thing as well, like, uh, I enjoyed listening to sort of all the different perspectives about using Selenium and, and the things that people do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, loads of the talks were really good, but those, those were the two that sort of stuck out for me. Um, Great. But like you, I spent a lot of time in the hallway as well. Great. And Jim? Well, and as always, uh, I have to. I, I, I'm taking a back seat to Simon, and uh, <laughs> and it, and he's stolen my thunder yet again, uh, because those were the two. Those were two of the talks that I thoroughly enjoyed as well. Uh, was was Anthony's and uh, and Jonathan Lips, and those were the two that stuck out in my mind that I was going to actually mention. Uh, so thanks for thanks for that, Simon. Um, All right. <laughs> um, it was it was interesting to hear uh, Dan Cuellar speak. Also, um, we also had some lovely keynotes as well. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed listen. I'm, I I I am always happy to listen to Jason Huggins tell war stories. Um, and um, uh, I think a very useful talk, or one that that I that that I I liked that. that that I liked that the information got out there was uh, David Burns when he was discussing visibility of stuff in in, in WebDriver. Oh um, yeah. Obviously, yeah. that's obviously all, all of those things are things that I've encountered, you know, personally in in many different uh, environments. But uh, that information, it was really great to hear that actually put out there publicly for why that's such a challenging part of working with Selenium and WebDriver. Yeah, it's great to point out. So, so for those of you watching who, who aren't familiar with the talk, so Dan Quayar is um, uh, creator, co-creator, Appium, but he, he talked about advanced Appium at the conference, so he gives a little more behind the scenes about what goes into the project. And uh, Jason Huggins, creator of Selenium, um, has moved on from the Selenium project technically uh, and is really focused on robots and of course talked about a fair number of war stories with regards to automating things that are just really challenging to automate. Um, and uh, and so it's really good to to also hear from David Burns about the visibility of Selenium. It's like the most aside from find element, checking to see if an element is displayed is is probably the most commonly used uh, thing behind find element within the Selenium project. And so understanding uh, the transparency of how that works and why that's actually a really challenging problem to solve across browsers uh, in a consistent way as standards continue to to evolve is really uh, is really refreshing to hear. I don't think that's a perspective that's uh, specifically for that pain point. Has, has I don't think that's really been shared uh, in a in a large way. And so I think across all of those, Jim, you're hitting on a great point, and that's that um, there's a lot of transparency into both the Appian project and the Selenium project, uh, and the hist history behind the Selenium project that that is made available in some of these talks, which I think is really great. And uh, Brian, what do you think? What was a uh, favorite talk for you? Yeah, so this was this was my first Splendid Con, uh, and something that we've been you know dealing with a lot recently at Code.org. You know, we're we are, we're a pretty new project in terms of getting our all of our tests set up. Uh, so I was very interested in the talk talking about you know flakiness and analytic contests. Um, Hugh McCantle's talk uh, had some interesting had kind of an interesting overview of how they use Elasticsearch and throw all their all their test data into there and some pretty some pretty graphs and stuff on how uh, how different tests how different test steps uh, would be flaky or not flaky and how how they kind of analyze tests and try to make them shorter. Um, also like Lauren Rubin's talk on uh, element locators and kind of which ones are flaky and and uh, you know using XPath versus CSS and and what do you do when uh, when a selector fails or you know changes because of code changes? Which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, those are all really uh, really great talks to reference. I know that there was a common uh, 
thread that seemed to permeate through more than just those two talks, almost a half, probably a half dozen talks at least, where um, talking about the flakiness of tests. There's actually two talks in particular that had to do with, um, just like with Hugh McCampbell's talk where he did an aggregate measurement of test runs over time and test steps. There was another talk by Dave Cad, uh, mispronounced his name, Cadwallader, um, where it's, it's big data ah. makes the flake. Big data makes the flake go yep. away, and, and um, I think those are all really great to see uh, companies that are really trying to tackle test flakiness. Uh, and Oren's uh, talk really speaks to kind of the lifeblood of your tests with with good locators and, and uh, issues you run into with with writing tests. Not just specifically record how it correlates to his record and playback um, efforts, but in general as it relates to test automation. And then there was a bunch of other talks about. Um, good test design, or if the talk wasn't about it, it definitely came up in the talk or as, as questions that came up after the talk. So I definitely felt like there was a, a thread about that going on. So those are those are great talks to reference. Um, yeah. And of course, Jason Huggins' talk on robots is cool. Because <laughs> <laughs> robots, robots are always cool. <laughs> so exactly. well, that's, that's great. Um, do you, uh, and I'll start with you, Brian, and work back to Simon, but I'm just curious if, if, uh, if you have, like, aside from the talks, if there was, like, one or two key takeaways that you had, something that really stuck with you is, like, um, now that, you know, you think back on it and there's just, there's an idea that you feel like you really wanted to go and try and implement or there was a, you're like, you're right, that is a problem or that is a way to solve that problem or there's some cool new piece of technology you really intended to go try. Is there anything that really stuck with you after the conference? Yeah, so I, uh, there's this, this one idea of kind of, uh, well, generally just kind of measuring flakiness and then using that data to inform test behavior. Uh, one thing I, that sounded kind of interesting to try was uh, was taking basically your test flakiness data and kind of running, ru like r running the reruns alongside the actual runs um, rather than kind of waiting for it to fail and then running them. Um, that sounded like it could help kind of reduce the reduce the overall test time if you're uh, if you're running in massively parallel. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, generally the the advice on selectors and uh, so I think it kind of a there's some good tips on basically what to what sort of stuff to look for in terms of narrowing in on what is causing the flakiness. That was kind of the Flakiness is always <laughs> top of mind, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's something that impacts everybody. Uh, and those are, yeah, it's great to see like how to diagnose test flakiness as it's as it's happening from test runs and potential remediation. And it seemed like a lot of those talks were also focused on just finding um, target areas to where to focus on to to maybe find right. te testing improvement or seeing being able to separate test issues based on poor test design and test setup or locators versus the actual environment, like the application under test having issues. Right. In which browser is like, yeah, bucketing by which yeah. browser are having different issues with which test. Yeah. Which test. So for, yeah. And, and in, in aggregate, right? Because a lot of times I think people right. don't have a lot of history to, to look at that kind of stuff. That's, that's, those are some great, some great takeaways. Um, Jim, what do you got? Well, let's see. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that I always take back and take away from, from Selenium Conference, and, and my perspective is a little bit skewed being uh, a contributor to the project, uh, but one of, the, one, of the things that, one of the things that I often, uh, that I always come away with from Selenium Conference is just how many different ways people are using Selenium and WebDriver and to accomplish you know, really amazing stuff in their organizations. Um, the, uh, I, 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 took, I also wanted to take away some of the improvements that I had seen in some of the page object uh, generation, uh, or not generation, but page object use. Uh, there were a couple of interesting ideas that came out of there. Again, pointing back to Anthony's talk for his uh, screenplay pattern. Uh, that had some really interesting implications for how we do things where I work, which is at Salesforce. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I was excited to take that away. But always the biggest, the biggest takeaway for me is always uh, seeing how other people are really using it and, and getting inspired by some of those great stories. 
That's great. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see. I think that the the screen uh, the screenplay pattern is is definitely um, getting more uh, more publicity now, and it's exciting to see an evolution of uh, of the page object pattern. And it's really exciting to hear about how you're considering the implications of that at Salesforce, because any anything like that that could be tested out at scale is always pretty exciting because we could really see like, well, how is this better than page objects? Uh, does it does it scale well across, you know, however millions of tests you guys have? Um, but but it's, I'm excited to hear, you know, what's coming in terms of potential case studies from people trying out what, what they learned at Selenium Conf London and maybe giving a talk uh, in six months in, in Austin um, or even at a future conference after that. That'd be really exciting to hear. Simon, what do you got? Uh, takeaways from the conference. Um, I liked the, one of the things is like this sort of move towards stability and ease of maintenance of tests, which has always been sort of the, sort of the Achilles heel of, of Selenium. Like, how do you make these things stable? How do you do it? Um, so that was good. I think <clears throat> um, Janelle Klein's keynote on a program as God to humans um, sort of helped bring home the fact that actually software is about people um, and their interactions and stuff like that. So so that was one of the things that I took away. And that was reinforced by sort of the comments we had at the Q&A at the end where people were going like, well, how do we contribute? How do we get started? And, you know, we've always been quite good at encouraging people to contribute code, um, but the sort of documentation stuff fell by the wayside. Um, and certainly since the since the conference, sort of the people who were there um, have started putting pull requests and stuff like that forward. Um, and so the thing that I took away was like, uh, we should you know show people that there's more ways to contribute to the project than just uh, sitting there and hacking on a keyboard. You can sort of write the documentation. You can help us you know um, identify problems, triage bugs, whatever it is. And we haven't been very good at communicating that. So sort of. Having that be brought home was was really important to me as well. Oh, that's that's a really great point to bring up. Um, the some of the softer talks in the keynote forum, your your talk for um, Zen and the art of open source software maintenance, uh, and Janelle's talk, I think paired well together. Um, where, like you said, uh, it's software is about people in a large capacity, um, and coding is actually a smaller piece of that. Um, I think that's great. The thing that's that I think is really great for everyone to hear, though, is like finding ways for people to get involved, like showing that in a more consistent way. Um, and I know that traditionally, there every year uh, at Selenium Conf, there is uh, also workshops, uh, all-day workshops the day before the conference, um, and the the standard fare is typically. Um, a getting started with Selenium workshop, uh, a Selenium grid workshop, mobile testing with Appium, and a committers workshop. And the committers workshop is the one I want to speak about briefly. Um, Simon, uh, you typically uh, run this committers workshop, which is an all-day affair where you help people uh, that show up, you help them uh, do a, uh, a shallow checkout of the GitHub repo for Selenium and help them get their build working and help, help them show how the build system with Buck works. Is that correct? Yeah, I generally I do it, but this year it was it was Jim stepping into the into my shoes and doing an absolutely brilliant job doing that. Yeah, I, absolutely, and I think the the thing to point out here though is that if if anyone is ever interested in finding a way to help get involved in contributing code, that's basically the place where where that information is shared right now. I think that it seems like there is some opportunity for us to obviously capture that um, and share it in other ways, um, but. But based on your experience having run the Committers Workshop and Jim, your experience, uh, I guess this is your second time running the Committers Workshop now. Um, how, do you, how do you feel like that, that worked out? Do you feel like people really uh, really got the hang of, uh, of the material and do you feel like we're, we're in for a, a spike in Committers for the project? Do you want to go first, Jim? Yeah, I'll go ahead and, 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 and chat. Um, I think that uh, I think that yes. I mean, we've already seen some pull requests that were direct a direct result of the workshop this year, and we did and and we did also last year. Um, and, and so I think you know, and it, every time every time we do that workshop, we do we do get uh, you know at least some pull requests out of the out of the as, as an output to that uh, to that workshop. Uh, and I really enjoy doing it uh, because it's always it's always interesting to, to, to for uh, to see new people who 
uh, you may, may not have understood all the intricacies of building selenium, uh, and because of the project's um, uh, uh, requirements, uh, building it and getting into building it can be, and figuring out how to get an environment set up can be a bit of a challenge, um, and not something that's just very easily uh, necessarily covered by a series of documents on the web. Um, you know, I think that uh, that that uh, that I, I've not failed to get a positive response from that workshop, uh, and uh, both in terms of people coming back and giving me feedback and saying, you know, we got a lot out of this, or and uh, as well seeing uh, contributions from uh, direct as a direct result from that workshop into the project itself. I mean, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think Jim is, has covered off uh, a lot of it. I mean, one of the requests we always get after doing that workshop is like, oh, you should, you should video this um, and, and make it available for people. Um, and one of the problems with it is it's typically an entire day, which is quite a commitment to make to watching a YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a lot. But the other thing as well is that sort of part of what makes it really interesting is just seeing how strange other people's computers are. Like you think everything is, is going to be simple and easy and we sort of iron out the cracks and there's nothing that can go wrong and every time we do this somebody's machine is sort of interestingly configured in a, in a way that you've never seen before um, and that causes new and interesting breakages in the build. Um, huh. And so, sort of, we could document it and we could put it up on a, as a video. And I mean, just going through the steps is a really good idea. But the intricacies, sort of, of where, like, I don't know, network version of Git or whatever it is, sort of always seems to trip us up. Um, yeah. Which hmm. complicates things. Of course, yeah. Well, okay, so, that, so that's really interesting to hear. Uh, I think every year the Committers Workshop goes well, the workshops go well, and, and we gain some more momentum. Um, switching back to talking about kind of the future-looking um, pieces from the conference, seems like there's some, I wouldn't go so far as to say maybe emerging trends, but I definitely see some some trending in favor, like we talked about testability. Um, there were a couple of talks on uh, like things like automated visual testing, some of these kind of more seemingly newer technologies that are starting to become more common, I think. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts on uh, where you see things heading uh, in terms of things people should be paying attention to, uh, but they aren't. Uh, and it could be not even new tech, it could just be some something to do with fundamentals, or it could be a new piece of tech or a new pattern like a screenplay pattern. Do you feel like there is you know, if, if everyone uh, did one thing, <laughs> uh, really uh, paid attention to one thing, what should it be in the next year? And I'll, we'll start with you, Simon, and work to the right. Oh, one thing. Um, I think the thing that is finally coming to fruition is the W3C spec. Um, and the interesting thing that this has is that it's getting harder to figure out where the bugs lie in the system. Like if you're running a Selenium test and something goes wrong, um, you know, is it in the Selenium libraries? Is it in the um, you know driver provided by browser vendor? Is it somewhere else, right? Or is it in the browser? Um, and you know, you go back four or five years, um, and if there was a problem with the Selenium test, it was always going to be someone in the Selenium project who would be sitting there fixing it. Like we we controlled all the all the drivers and stuff like that, um, and now. That's no longer true. And, you know, we saw a certain amount of that when we asked people, like, hey, have you flipped to Selenium 3 yet? And they were going, well, it doesn't work with Firefox yet. And it's like, well, Selenium 3 does work with Firefox, but the, the Gecko driver adheres to the W3C spec, and they're busily implementing the sort of uh, advanced user interaction stuff, and that seems to be sort of the main stumbling block. And, you know, the, it's complicated by the fact that the advanced user inter interaction stuff in the W3C spec is now spec'd out, um, but there aren't client-side bindings. There aren't like Java bindings or a .NET. Um, and so one of the things that Jim and I did was sort of hack through some proposed APIs for like how that would feel. And I think we ended up with something quite nice. But the one thing that I'd ask people to keep an eye on is 
keeping up to date with the drivers that are provided by the browser vendors um, because that's a very fast moving um, target in some places. Right, right. So, yeah, which is for every browser now because it used to be Firefox was bundled with uh, with the client side bindings, right? And now it's you have to just like with Chrome driver and IE driver and Edge driver, you have to get Gecko driver for Firefox to work for for Selenium three and new newish versions from what Firefox forty seven on up. Yeah, forty seven oh one was the last one where we have the um, uh, the the Selenium official the the the, the version of the the Firefox driver that we wrote, um, rather than Gecko driver, the one that Mozilla wrote. Um, yeah. Now Larry about the sort of multi break and because of the way that works is you never be able to get Mozilla to agree to that sign off. Right. So so um I uh, my my audio cut out, so I wasn't sure if that's me or you. But um, the it sounded like you're saying that there's still a little bit to be navigated there, um, and it's also um, I guess worth pointing out that people can uh, still run their tests on we uh, using the legacy Firefox driver, but there's just some additional configuration, and you need to use a slightly older version of Firefox to accomplish that. Is that right? Uh, Dave, I think we have a slight problem with Simon's audio at the moment, so uh, I think we'll just let okay. him fix it and uh, and uh, okay. he'll rejoin in a, in a minute or two. Okay, uh, sure. Looks like he's muted, but um, Jim, uh, do you everything I just said does that sound about right? That sounds about right, and uh, I, I you know to sort of piggyback off of what uh, what Simon was saying uh, in terms of things to trends to look for or things to to uh, to look for in in the near in the near future sort of in the near and the intermediate term um, the, the 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 browser vendor supplied drivers like gecko driver for example um, you know that's the way forward. Uh, the the Edge driver is produced by Microsoft. The Safari driver there is a Safari driver now that's produced by Apple uh, that is included with um, with Safari uh, as part of Safari. And uh, by and large, the language bindings already just support these drivers uh, as as they are. Uh, but there has been from what I have. Observed and what I talk, what I what I what I heard at the conference, um, many people have not adopted those technologies or have not adopted to trying to use them so that those browser vendors can then it can then uh, fix whatever issues may be in their implementation. And so going forward, that's something to be to, to look for in the going forward in the future is that. Those drivers are going to become more and more prevalent, and and it's going to be important to uh, for users to update to using them, so that uh, they can be so so that both for the in for the uh, continued uh, correct operation of their own uh, Selenium code, but also so that we can get uh, issues reported back to the um, to the uh, to whoever it is that actually wrote the the, drive, the browser driver. Uh, one other thing that going forward, I, I got a lot of I, I I remember getting a lot of questions about at um, at uh, uh, at the Selenium conference was what's the future of the IE driver like? I mean, is it just no longer going to be done because now Microsoft is all about Edge? And the reason and and my answer then and my answer still is uh, the IE driver is going to be around for a good long while yet uh, enterprises have still are, are still using Internet Explorer and Microsoft still supports Internet Explorer so uh, that driver will still be around for uh, the foreseeable future and that's that's uh, that's 
you know, something forward to look something to look forward to as well is that IE is going to continue to be a thing. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, backwards compatibility support for older versions. Um, I'm curious to see the the curve of adoption for for edge driver over IE, um, just in terms of people's preferences, um, and also the distribution of operating systems that support it. And um, but those are great great points. Thanks, Jim, for that. And and of course, there's uh, obviously a nuance for each of the browser driver implementations because um, just like with Microsoft. Um, with support uh, initially limited, and that's why you created IE driver um, and, and uh, support it. Uh, Safari driver, uh, up until recently, has suffered a similar fate, right? Um, it wasn't it someone at Google that created uh, the Safari driver implementation, and now we have this newer uh, baked-in uh, web driver implementation uh, with a yeah. new version of Safari, but it's a, basically a browser extension using an old paradigm uh, for architecture. Is that right? Jason Labor wrote the. Um, most recent Safari driver from the Selenium project, um, and yeah, Apple have now written their own, which communicates with Safari in a far more sophisticated way. Oh, that's terrific. So, so now we've uh, that's that's we've effectively covered all of the major bases, right? Where now the the master plan was effectively just get the major browser vendors to to take on the implementation and, and build it into their, their browser and maintain a browser driver. Is that, that's, that was the plan, right? And now we've, we've effectively reached, uh, reached that plan across all major browser vendors, right? Uh, yeah, all we need to do is finish the spec. And, and as, far as, as far as the changes that are needed for the changes, uh, so now the changes for the spec being ratified, once that happens, then Selenium 4 would be the implementation, which would just effectively be uh, changes in the back end, but nothing to the actual client side API, is that right? Yeah, so Selenium 2 was like, hey, look, we've introduced WebDriver. Selenium 3 was, um, we've taken out um, the original Selenium core implementation and removed the RC API. Selenium 4 um, will be, we've changed the wire protocol to be W3C, the W3C one and not the um, JSON wire protocol, which we've been using for a long time. Um, User-facing changes should be fairly minimal. Right. Um, you'll get the new fancy user interactions API, um, which allows you to do like multi-touch and a whole bunch of interesting stuff like that, um, and gives you sort of more sophisticated controls. You can imagine drawing like a circle with two fingers or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, the main user-facing change will be uh, will be invisible in that the, the wire protocol will, will, will have to shift. Um, but then that's going to affect companies like, you know, um, a browser stack and source labs and people like that who, who have their own version of the, the service that they use. Right. Right. That's a great point. So service providers will be affected. Um, would you would you go so far as to say that given that the web driver specification will be ratified and that major browser vendors are officially supporting it, that tool providers, commercial tool vendors, uh, would you think that they're going to all start to offer some sort of um, commercial support for Selenium and basically build their tool offering on top of it? Well, I can speak some to that. Um, I, I know that um, uh, I know that's already starting to happen. Uh, I, I've seen it start to happen in some of the commercial tools um, with, uh, you know, I know that, for example, SmartBear in their test complete project, uh, in, in their, um, their product, they, um, they have already begun that work to fully, more fully support WebDriver uh, and native execution of WebDriver tests in that, in that, uh, uh, in, in, in that product. So I know that it is happening. Um, right. I would, oh. I would only anticipate that, that that's going to become more prevalent as, um, as time goes on. Um, you know, I, I, there, I've, I've seen it happen in the industry. I've seen it start to happen in the industry. I can only imagine that it's going to continue to go forward. I'll put it that way. Yeah, it's also interesting with the SmartBear example because they recently acquired cross-browser testing. Uh, the company that is effectively a, it's like a Sauce Labs competitor um, for offering cross-browser um, uh, service. And uh, it makes sense with the, the point you just made about test complete integration with WebDriver and, and offering a cloud backend support effectively. Um, I, I, if I recall, didn't 
uh, HP with like Lean FT, didn't they start to, or they're talking about maybe in their in some future effort, like there was going to be some sort of um, integration potentially with with Selenium. Um, I, I like to joke with people that um, if you aren't familiar with what, if you do test automation and you aren't familiar with what Selenium is, uh, you will be because you'll likely be using it in your day job and not even know it. Right. That's, uh, I, I do know that there are some plans uh, in, in the works over at HPE um, uh, between that and their, and their upcoming merger with MicroFocus. Um, uh, they, they have, they, I know they have some plans in the works. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much is public at this point. Uh, so I really don't want to say anything. I don't want to say anything speculative about that because I don't know how much is uh, how much they've actually announced in, in, in pub, uh, uh, publicly. Yeah. But I do know that there are some plans that they have that they have made that are in the works there. Yeah, that's that's really interesting to see that that's kind of where the trend is heading. I think. Um, I mean, there's always the the really interesting ideas around um, good test design and and. Uh, dealing with good setup and good locators, but it's really cool to see that there's a bigger push happening kind of above that with the existing commercial tools. And it used to be very competitive, right? I mean, back, you think back to um, the first or second Selenium Conf, it was always this uh, chart that was put up, this graph uh, someone would always put up on the screen, which was here is the job trend for uh, like basically HP test tools uh, and and, he, and here is the here is the trend of jobs for selenium in the marketplace and and how uh, we were gaining and then we passed it and now what was it um, uh, recently what was it for India that was the first time that we had an official sponsorship uh, agreement with HP so HP officially now is uh, supporting uh, pieces of the selenium project which I feel like is kind of there's a there's a few moments in life where when something happens, um, no matter where you are, uh, confetti should rain down uh, from the sky and champagne bottles should magically appear and corks should start popping. So I feel like the fact that HP became an official sponsor for the conference was one of those moments. Um, and then another one was probably when um, we actually had people we had Edge Driver offering official support for WebDriver to the extent where they actually had four or five people working on the Edge team. Uh, show up to Selenium Conf in Portland, and then more recently we had uh, when we had the announcement that uh, Safari Driver was going to be built into, or the uh, there was going to be official web driver support built into Safari. I feel like those are like some key moments in the project where no matter where you were, if you were a committer on the project, you should have this amazing experience of confetti just raining down. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> so, um, yeah. So so that's that's great to see that that this kind of stuff is shifting. Also, on top of that, I, I do think that there are some really interesting. Uh, things happening in the industry. Some are boring, some are a little bit cooler. And I, I want to talk uh, to you a little bit, Brian, about that. I know that you do um, some work with uh, trying out a whole bunch of new things. And I'm curious, uh, based on your previous experience and what you've heard from people at the conference and the talks you saw, um, yeah. between, the, between those two things, like what do you feel like is, is something that, that's going to be catching on a bit more uh, for, for people who aren't aware in the coming, in the coming year? Yeah, so I think there's kind of uh, maybe two things going on. Uh, one, you know, as as a lot of as a lot of logic has moved, started to move into the front end, um, just among you know small engineering teams building websites now, and it's not clicking links, you know, clicking buttons, so much as you know you're going to have a lot of complex JavaScript JavaScript logic. I think a lot of small teams now are are starting to use uh, you know Selenium and doing cross-browser testing, whereas I think before they wouldn't be able to. Um, that's kind of what I've seen outside of the conference. Uh, and then inside of the conference, um, it seems like one of the, yeah, one of the things that I, I remember uh, back when we were first getting started with testing, it was like doing all this, doing all this, uh, you know, work figuring out the selectors and, um, you know, dealing with test flakiness. Uh, and I was like, man, it'd be cool. If you could just, and you know, we would still have these breakages that we wouldn't be able to find what the actual, you know, we, where we wouldn't be able to find an easy way to test it. Like a button would show up, and you'd be like, "Why did that button show up?" So at one point, I tried to build a visual testing uh, tool that would basically just take a screenshot and compare it. It was very hard. Uh, and then I heard about the Apple tools, and they figured out basically how to do visual testing. Uh, so I was like, so I yeah, we started with that, 
and from what I understand, visual testing is somewhat new in terms of people actually starting to use it. Um, but there was Adam's talk and uh, Oren's talk on basically where it's like starting to become a, a more mainstream thing. I don't, I don't know if it's quite a trend yet. It seemed like the, it, there weren't a ton of teams using it yet, but it uh, seems like that might be a thing that's starting to become more and more uh, feasible for like smaller teams to set up. Whereas I think when I was doing some research, when I was thinking of building my own one, it was just a couple of, you know, it was like Google was building one and uh, just very large teams were, were experimenting with it. But I think that's kind of becoming maybe a future trend. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely see more talks um, about it at other conferences too, which makes me feel like it's starting to catch on. I do think that, I mean, I spent um, over a year kind of researching it as well. And uh, I learned that there's actually a fair number of open source libraries out there. Uh, last research uh, wave I did was there's something on the order of 18 different libraries available across probably three or four different programming languages. Um, and and the, a lot of the open source libraries are really good. It does a simple baseline image comparison. Uh, take a snapshot, and then next time you run the test, takes another snapshot, compares the two, and does um, potentially some sophisticated um, matching of the images to, to have it not just be a pixel by pixel comparison. Um, I definitely right. think it's, I think it's really, regardless of if you use a commercial tool or an open source tool, I think it's worth thinking about looking into it for an existing test practice, definitely. Um, and it's definitely becoming more reliable. I, I feel like it's, it's uh, a lot of the technology is actually rather mature and people don't realize it because if they think it's immature because they tried it a couple years ago and, and it didn't work out so well, it's actually gotten right. pretty good. A lot of these libraries are actually built to work um, really easily with Selenium. So you could take existing Selenium tests and add in and uh, basically uh, fortify your assertions, right? So instead of doing like one single assertion to see if an element displayed or if certain text was on the page or whatever, um, you could actually right. take a snapshot of a page and, and end up effectively getting hundreds of assertions with this image check. And uh, and it just takes a few lines of code to typically do, which is really tremendous. So yeah, right. I, agree with, I, I agree with your assessment. On the other side of it, I do think there's some boring stuff that people uh, should pay attention to that they're they might not be um, and I just think that there hasn't been um, a lot of knowledge sharing around good uh, consistently around good test design I know that every conference we have a lot of talks about yeah. page, ob page objects but now I feel like we're starting to get um, a lot more uh, people sharing their experiences trying to do some sort of aggregation of test runs to find flakiness uh, talking about locators talking about good test design um, almost as you know, a requirement from day one, as opposed to kind of an afterthought. And right. so I think, but a lot of people have, um, like, a lot of people are kind of forced have forced upon them an existing test infrastructure, uh, and, and they're forced to like try to go and fix it and figure it out. And I feel like now people right. are being equipped with the knowledge necessary to to kind of wrangle that and understand when they look at something, how do they discern if it's good or not? Other than maybe they know it tacitly, but actually having something right. Like that more quantifiable. Yeah. So I think I see I see that also becoming something that's trending. Uh, and that's at least my experience and, and it sounds like it kind of matches your experience. And I'm really curious for you, Jim, given that you do so much um, work at Salesforce and, and you guys have such a massive selenium footprint. Um, does that does that kind of resonate with you or do you feel like there's there's something else kind of coming coming down the pike in terms of uh, future trends people should pay attention to? Well, you know, um, we're in we're in a bit of a um, uh, a bit of a unique position at Salesforce, just because we do have a very large number of uh, Selenium tests, and it's been an it's been it, it, it it's part of what of my day to day work has been to uh, help to streamline that very large uh, bed of tests, that very large collection of tests and try to encourage better practices for uh, which, which of those tests are actually necessary versus which would be better served by a different type of test rather than using uh, a full UI-based web uh, stack to test it. Uh, right. so, you're, so you're making sure that it, you know, if, it, if it would be better served by like a, an integration test or an integration you know. test or, or, or even a unit test in some cases or even in a case where we're doing an API test of a of a restful API or a web based API uh, we shouldn't be using the browser to test that 
Uh, and we've come a long way in the last few years for doing that. And going forward, I think we're starting to see a, a lot more recognition in the industry as a whole that um, that Selenium tests, you know, that, or or you know, UI-based automated tests are really only a part of the solution and really should be a relatively smaller part of the solution than other types of tests. And I'll, I'll, uh, I want to, I want to, something that Simon has said many, many times, you know, Selenium tests or, or, or UI-based tests provide kind of two different levels of security for, for your, you know, of, of feeling that you're testing the right things. The first is the functional, the actual functional does this code work the way we expected it to work? The other is a bit of a a bit of a, a safety, you know, a, 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 a feeling of safety because you can see things being executed, right? And you can you can watch the test run and you can watch that it's actually doing things. What we what I think we're starting to see is that people are now starting to feel better about not having not having to have the same level of that feeling good because I can watch it working versus other types of testing. And I, I, I think that's, that's an industry-wide thing that is starting to become more and more prevalent, which I think is good. Mm, yeah, if I could jump in real yeah. quick. Yeah, I definitely saw that across, across many different talks. I think people are starting to think more and more of, yeah, where does where does these where do these cross browser tests fit in, and then how do you as as you're working with your team to figure out you know should this be a unit test should this be an integration test uh, kind of what the culture becomes around that uh, so like Angie Angie Jones's talk was uh, covered a lot of that basically how to how for for different for for your team you know integrating with the developers on your team and figuring out how can we maybe move some of these tests closer to the code, uh, yet still get good coverage on issues? Right. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Like stuff that's, you know, some, some of it might be uh, really just conversation process, like just understanding of, of where you could push stuff down um, and, and less of it being uh, the people who are doing uh, the test automation are separate from the development, like trying to really integrate that um, across the chasm there. Um, it's really interesting to, to hear. It's like this is stuff I've been I've been hearing at conferences for the last ten years, um, and and it's it's still something that I think people struggle with in in the industry. I think a lot of it has to do with um, that the people using Selenium aren't these whiz bang startups that are um, doing all cool new stuff. And even with that, there's challenge. Like it's very easy to end up with some potentially legacy code with with poor test implementation. Um, but I think the struggle is real for people who work at companies with um, existing code bases that are massive um, and uh, and and have been around for you know over a decade. And I think that that's where you end up with a lot of this um, challenge. Um, and so definitely, were some talks that covered that kind of stuff. It's great to see kind of a diversity of topics at the conference um, to cover not just the technical aspects of things, but some of it being more process oriented. Um, so, so that's uh, that's refreshing to hear. Uh, yeah. So, I, like I said, I think there's some there's some cool new stuff, and then there's like some boring stuff that everybody should be doing, but most people aren't. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm glad to hear that that is something that tracks with what you guys are uh, were experiencing. Um, so, uh, so changing gears a little bit, I did want to talk briefly about what I think is arguably my favorite piece of Selenium Conf every year. Uh, the closing keynote uh, is the committers panel. So every committer that was able to attend the conference in person, we get them all up on a stage, um, and then we have a handful of mics, uh, and we, ha we basically hand the mic, you know, we have someone run around to the audience, to people that want to ask questions of the committers panel. And then sometimes we take questions that are submitted in advance uh, through a Google forum or through Twitter. And um, and then we just kind of see where the conversation takes us. Very in a, in a way, it's similar to kind of what we're doing on this webinar, but it's very specific to things in the Selenium project. Um, and uh, and so a lot of really great topics came up in the committers panel, and it does every year. Um, and so there was one topic in particular that I um, uh, actually there's two, but there's one I definitely want to talk about, which came up, and it's something that I think is of interest to a lot of people in the community, um, and that is record and playback. Um, that's something that uh, we don't we don't typically have that many talks about um, at 
Selenium Conf. And I know that Selenium largely gained a lot of popularity because of Selenium IDE, which is the browser uh, plugin for Firefox that enables you to uh, record your, your interactions with the browser and store uh, the test actions um, as a file to be reused. Um, but it's, it's notoriously, I think, got a bad rap, and I think that um, it hasn't really received a lot of support um, in, in the recent semi-mid-term history of the project. And I'm really curious your thoughts about uh, where you see things heading for um, you know, Selenium, the project itself, uh, providing support for a record and playback tool like Selenium IDE uh, as, and the potential impacts that that has for the community at large. And, and uh, either, I'm assuming Simon or Jim, you, you have opinions about this, so either, either one of you can chime in here. Well, I, I definitely have opinions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like you say, like record and playback is a really crucial part of the sort of plethora of offerings that you can get using for automated testing. Um, you know, there are loads of reasons for doing it. There's sort of, um, just, it's the easiest way to report a bug. You go click, 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 and away you go, you're done. Um, maybe you don't really have experience with the programming language. Um, you know, maybe you're just trying to throw something together quickly to, to get it in place. Or maybe, like, this is the strategy that your company has picked. Um, which, we always say to people, you should try and use code, but not everyone can code. So, there might be some valid reasons for doing it. Um, so having some sort of record playback tool is a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, the problem you've got on the Selenium project is uh, it's open source, right? We're not a company. We're not um, a, a thing where people get paid to do stuff. Um, and we just haven't got anyone who's really fired up about working on record playback tools, um, which is slightly unfortunate because it means that we don't have that area of expertise. Um, one of the things that David Byrne said in the committee panel, panel, which I thought was really interesting, was maybe a record playback tool should be something that's offered as part of a browser's developer tools. Um, you know, this mechanism for going, okay, here's, here's something that I'm trying to do. And with the infrastructure that people are putting in place for supporting WebDriver, the, the W3C spec, um, maybe that would be a, a possibility. Um, I'd, I'd love to see it. I mean, the other thing that might happen is that um, commercial tool vendors such as HP might decide to do sort of some some low-end, cheap record playback tool to, to encourage people to sort of um, investigate their stuff. Um, but, I mean, it's a piece of the puzzle that needs filling. I'm just not sure how to fill it. Yeah, I think... Uh or in, in Oren's talk, he, he covered a little bit of the, the tool that he's working on, Testin, which is, it, yeah, is browser-based. And I played with it a little bit, and it's definitely a, a nice experience having the, the test recording in the place where your, you know, your tests are actually being run, and you can iterate on them very quickly. So I could see the, I could definitely see a need for, for something like that in open source as well. Yeah. I, the thing I'll add before, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts, Jim, but I definitely want to chime in and say that I feel like that the my experience, I, I reviewed over two dozen different tool vendors that have at some point in the last uh, eight years have, have tried their hand at building a record and playback tool because I think people think that um, a, lot, a lot of people feel like that's a, a, need, a need that's unmet. Um, and tr historically, the under the happy path cases for an application, how it's built, um, if it's built for testability, if it's built following the spec for HTML, um, all of those things. Uh, I think that record and playback works well. It knows how to you know, find the ID and do all those things. But generally speaking, you know, 80%, 90% of the time, apps aren't built to be testable. Apps don't have great markup that's semantic um, with good locators. And so as a result, the, the record and playback tools do their best uh, guess at what would be a, a workable locator. And they're typically very brittle. Um, and, and they don't really withstand any sort of change to you know the markup on the page. So like the element that you wanted to interact with potentially moved, but it's still on the page. And the record and playback tool just found a very brittle um, uh, locator for that. And so I, I think that that's the that's kind of partly where the bad rap comes from record and playback. I agree, it's definitely a, a valuable asset to the to the community. 
Um, and the thing I liked about Oren's talk is that he talks about ways to try to mitigate those concerns, and that's why this idea of like a statistical element locator. I'd love it if we could take and convince Oren to take his commercial tool and just open source the, <laughs> the clearly the most valuable part of his IP uh, to <laughs> to the project, so we could just make all you know all of our record and playback problems a lot better. Um, so that, that's just my food for thought on on, on record and playback. And I uh, want to caveat like it's great, uh, but it might just be a throwaway test. Uh, it's not typical meant for prime time by itself might need some enhancements over time. That's why, That's why. correct me if I'm wrong guys, but Selenium IDE has the export to a programming language function that has some sort of transform to help you get tests uh, convert uh, from Selenium IDE converted into some form of code so you can then really improve upon them and, and follow good design practice. Yeah, there's an export function so you can throw together a series of tests quite quickly and then sort of refactor them and come up with something clear and apply the page object model and, and um, screenplay button and whatever it is that makes you feel happy. Yeah. And, and Jim, what are your thoughts on, on record and playback? Well, my thoughts on record and playback are that, and, and again, I'll echo what everyone else has, has already said, that I think it's an important part of the ecosystem of, uh, of Selenium slash WebDriver as, as, a, as a project. I think it's an important part of the ecosystem to have. It's an important tool to have as in, 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 in the tool bag uh, for Several of the reasons that have been mentioned here. First of all, you know the the, the ease and quickness of being able to just get something quickly done, uh, whether it's a throwaway thing or or you know something intended to be a little bit longer lasting. Uh, the other use case for really for really for a a good record and playback tool uh, is the is the case of, is the learning case where you haven't had a lot of experience with the Selenium library uh, or the WebDriver library and you really want to, uh, and, and it's part of learning, things that we take for granted, things like how do I, how do I locate an element, how do I, you know, so all these other things. Um, my challenge with record and playback as, a, again, it's a very important piece of the, of the puzzle uh, as a project, but Writing a good record and playback tool is hard, and it's and the challenge with it is is that the code that it produces tends to over time be less maintainable than code that is written uh, than code that is written by hand or that's exported from the record and playback tool and then subsequently maintained that way. Uh, and I think that that is the is the way going forward. Now, uh, and, and Simon already touched on on one of on the reasons why Selenium IDE hasn't received as much um, uh, as much attention in the you know in the in the recent past as it had before. Uh, again, one of the things that people sometimes don't always understand about the Selenium project is that. The code that gets checked in from the, to the Selenium project is by and large done by volunteers, uh, unpaid volunteers at that. And so, you know, what gets worked on is what people want to work on. You can't force somebody to, you know, volunteer their time to something they don't want to do. Um, so that's one of the reasons, and that none of the none of the current core contributors have a real passion about necessarily bringing that tool, uh, updating that tool. Uh, right. I will say that immediately following the conference, uh, there was a meeting of some people who have, who are affiliated with, with the Selenium project, some committers, some other just interested parties, who had a quick meeting at the Mozilla offices in London uh, for the day and kind of had a, a, a summit meeting or a, an initial design session, initial what would you, what would we want in sort of a next generation Selenium IDE? And uh, the I I didn't actually go to that meeting, but I did see some of the notes that were taken at that time. Um, and again, that was just a an initial sort of thing. So there's no timeline for anything or any any sort of uh, any sort of outcome from that group, other than you know it is something that people affiliated with the project are thinking about and want to have solutions for. Yeah, 
That's that's great. That's a great point. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the the meeting of the minds that happened for the Selenium IDE kind of envisioning, and I, I was really excited to see that that just kind of organically happened. Um, and that's another byproduct of why I think Selenium Comp is so great. It's, you know, it's a good communal um, gathering place. Um, and so so with that, I, I definitely want to transition to kind of wrapping things up. And uh, it's worth pointing out uh, two things. Uh, one, um, every year for the conference, we record the talks. And uh, they're all available free on YouTube. And actually, during the conference, we also live stream them. But um, they are recorded and, and available on YouTube right now. Um, if you go to YouTube and search for Selenium Conf UK, uh, you'll find the Selenium Conf UK uh, YouTube channel. And on there is all of the talks, um, all, I think it was 30 talks or so, including keynotes, um, and so you could watch everything there, and then if you actually head over to seleniumconf.co.uk, uh, you can find uh, more details uh, about the speakers, their bios, and I believe the slides will be posted there as well. Um, so it's worth checking that out, but um, uh, it's also worth pointing out, I think, the most important piece, which is looking ahead, uh, which is kind of the goal of this, this webinar, um, seleniumconf 2017. Um, is happening in Austin, Texas, uh, April 3rd through 5th. The third would be the pre-conference workshops, and then there's the fourth and fifth is the actual uh, two-day conference. And so if you go to seleniumconf.com, um, you can find find some more information about where it will be uh, and when it will be, as well, as well as sign up for the newsletter to receive uh, announcements about uh, details like when, it, when uh, speakers have been announced, uh, when tickets are on sale, that kind of stuff, um, and then as well as uh, submitting a talk, which is arguably the most important piece uh, that I want to convey to you. So if you go to slangconf.com, you can find out that the call for speakers is currently open. It's going to be open for until uh, sometime, I believe, uh, late January, uh, but all the information is listed on the website there. And if you submit a talk and it gets accepted, your travel will be paid for by the conference. Um, so it doesn't matter where, uh, where you're coming from. If, if we accept your talk, uh, we will pay for your trip. And we'd love to have you come and, and give a talk about something that you're, you're excited about that you're working on that you want to share with the community. Um, so uh, also, that, that link is in the chat, um, at the top of the chat, if you wanted to, um, to click on it. So seleniumconf.com, uh, both the links for the YouTube channel and uh, the conference for 2017 will be put into the email uh, that you'll get on Monday for the recording. Um, but I wanted to thank, uh, thank everyone for joining the panel. Uh, Simon, Jim, Brian, thank you for, for a great conversation. Uh, and thanks to all the attendees, uh, both that were here uh, during the live event and those that are watching it after the fact. And uh, Adid, um, was that everything? We good? Uh, I think we are, yeah. I think that we are uh, completely out of time. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for uh, participating. It was amazing. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, it's a great opportunity to also wish all of you happy holidays and a happy new year. And uh, just a, one piece of logistics. There were a handful of questions, and we could sift through them, and, and, uh, and maybe I could, we could figure out a follow-up blog post potentially um, for, for questions that seem like they'd be really keen to get answered. So uh, maybe that would be something we could tackle later. Of course. Definitely. Okay. Great. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Bye. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>